So actually, we, today, we, the, the, the really scary part is going to go away. So don't tell anybody if you want to keep your seat. But you're actually going to go down very quickly to much more down to earth and uh, traditional stuff. Let's just uh, uh, quickly recap where we are at. Um, the, the whole goal, the whole goal, was try to look at function spaces, and we did it by introducing reproducing current Hilbert spaces. The idea was that we want to work in infinite dimensional spaces, so Hilbert spaces are the natural choice. But it turns out that there is not enough structure in these spaces, so we need to add some more structure. And we start with this evaluation functional continuity, which is somewhat abstract, but we start to appreciate how it gives for free more. Okay, and it basically will boil down function analysis to linear algebra. That's the promise of, of this whole story. It's going to make because evaluating function as such a simple structure, just an inner product, we're going to get a lot of stuff free from that. Uh, the first step was to try is to uh, basically see that uh, the so-called reproducing kernel, k, a function from x to x, reals, is naturally assigned to the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Okay, it's a special function that lives in the space when you fix one of the two entries. And then if you multiply this special function to any other function, you are evaluating the function at the point. So it gives a particular representation of evaluation functionals. And it turns out that whenever you have this, you have that and the other way around. Okay? This was still pretty abstract. And so what we did last time, we actually, after uh, giving a bunch of examples of uh, reproducing Kernelber spaces, you remember some. So we said continuous function NL2. Not examples. What were positive examples? Van limited functions, and so on and so forth. Van limited function is something that in Fourier doesn't have anything after a, a, a point, the band. What were the extension of this? Allowed to get something, right? So you say, rather than 0, I have something, but it goes down exponentially fast, polynomially fast. And every time you choose how fast, you're choosing a kernel, OK? OK, these are kind of the fancy Fourier analysis like examples. Uh, they are uh, covering the more classical notion of smooth function spaces, where smooth becomes something meaningful because you're basically throwing away uh, oscillatory behavior. And these are just called Sobolev spaces. They are the most classical spaces of function that you use in statistics in when you do non-parametrics or, say, in uh, PDE. Whenever you need functions that are simple, you basically shoot for those first, and then you can try to get something else. If you are familiar with things like splines, they're not too far away from this. Okay, So by we already, one thing that we try to do in this course is that when we, re, when we go over more classical stuff like we're doing now, we try to do it in kind of a compact way in which we recovered maximum amount of previous information. And here we did already a bunch. Okay, All smoothness classes a la Sobolev are there. All the Fourier-like spaces we can build are there. All splines-like example are there. Okay. Uh, well, let's, let's also add that we actually rediscovered that linear functions are a kernel, where the kernel is just the inner product. And if we, the other example is a linear combination of independent features or atoms, functions that are linearly independent, in which case we basically can again find the kernel, which is just the inner product of the kernel. Okay? Okay, so that was what we did the first class. What we did the last class is to try to Understand there is even more going on by discovering that uh, there is an infinite, uh, intimate relationship between the notion of positive definiteness. So here we, we are also going to consider a function of two variables, but for the time being, we don't know whether it is a reproducing kernel in some space. There is nothing. There is only this one function. Do you remember what positive definite meant? I call a function of two variables positive definite if. <laughs> right, so you take you take k, you form a matrix with entry k x i j, which x i j any, you just fix m any, whatever you want, just in the space, and the matrix you obtain, uh, the gain value cannot be negative, it can be zero or positive, but they cannot be negative. Okay? And this can be written as the fact that the quadratic form has to be positive, which leads to the other way of writing this thing down. That is, if you actually take alpha i alpha j sum over i j from 1 to m, and this, this has to be bigger or equal than 0. So there is a slight, uh, slight thing to keep in mind that we say that a function is positive definite if the matrix is positive semi-definite. Okay? 
there is a slightly mismatch of the words that one and one might want to keep in mind once in a while. So we call it positive definite the function, even if here we allow to get the zero. It, it's not a big deal, but we're only gonna, gonna stick to this because it makes a lot of sense. Okay, why do we introduce this? Well, because it turned out that uh, um, it's easy to check that whenever you have a reproducing kernel, it is positive definite. Whenever you, again, the game here is to remember the assumption and the conclusion. Here the assumption is if I give you a space H, which is a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, so it has a reproducing kernel, then for free, I know that that function is actually positive definite. Why? You remember what was the key point in trying to go from there to here? Yeah, so do you remember how to? Write it as an inner product. Yeah, what? Right. So the key word in the story is, he told me the end of the story, but the beginning of the story is that you can write this as some kind of inner product because you have the reproducing property. So the key point to go from here to here is that K, that you can write this equation, K X X prime in H is equal to K X X prime. This is true because of the reproducing property. Okay, it's just a tautology once you have the reproducing property. Take this one thing and you plug it in here, you massage things, and you show that this is just the norm of a vector. Okay? It's exactly the same as is you would consider just the linear kernel. So you can, the way you prove that the standard the scalar product is positive definite is exactly the same way you prove that any reproducing kernel is positive definite. Okay? And you can clearly see that you can also prove that reproducing kernel are also symmetric. Okay? Because this order doesn't matter. Fair enough? Okay, so this is this is an interesting direction because it shows that you know it uh, you know the, 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 again we start from a very abstract thing we felt something more tangible here is something even more uh, intuitive, yet it's not clear how it is useful. The interesting thing is that you can in some sense you can invert this implication. You can ask if you give me this one special function, but now I don't have a space H. Can I build one and can I make it to be a reproducing kernel Hilbert space? So in some sense, I want to discover this other implication. Remember how this story went? We didn't quite give the proof. The proof has a couple of uh, has a couple of technical steps, but we gave kind of the sketch of the proof because it's actually kind of instructive. Do you remember? Given so the game is clear. I give you a function k of two variables with this property and symmetry. Okay. How do you build the space? Well, you don't have the space. You want to build it. Do you remember how you do it? combination of the right, So the first step is that you say, I'm going to consider things that look like this. Alpha i, k, x, i. Okay? These are the functions that I like. Where these are not training set. There is no data here. There is no training set. There's not. These are any x, 1 up to xm in the space of the im. x. Okay? Anything. And these are any coefficients. Okay? And you consider this kind of linear combination of pointed on any set of points of any cardinality, whatever. Okay. Okay. So we call this space the space uh, of function with this property H naught, and we argue that it's a linear space. You can sum and multiply by numbers, and you're not doing any harm. We want to get to a reproducing Hilbert space. So the first thing is to make it into a Hilbert space. Okay. So in Hilbert space, you have what? only you can sum things, but you can also take inner products, okay? So the second step we did is to define an inner product. So this, notice that really you have to do a, an effort in imagination. There is no space. There is no structure. We are inventing it. We are, we are putting it in it. And so the idea is that the inner product is going to become, uh, so let's say that B here is just um, J, KXJ, J from 1 to N, capital N. Then I define the inner product to be just okay. This is the expression. Then you can ask a few things: Is this uh, a symmetric thing? 
Can you show that it gives zero only if you put here a function which is itself zero? Kind of skipped it because you're in a rush, but this is actually kind of easy to see. Can you can you generate here a zero with a function that is not zero? This quantity, if you put the same function, you know, if you take a function times itself, what you get here is alpha i alpha j. Like by definition of positive definite, this cannot be bigger or equal than zero. And it's zero if and only if we just put all the alpha i to be exactly equal to zero, which means that we are taking the zero function. The symmetry and the positive definiteness of the inner product are just coming for free by the, our only assumption that is positive definiteness. Okay? The question that came last time, especially after the class, is are this, I'm assuming something about the fact that these KXI are linearly independent or somewhat nice. No. Look, I'm taking any crazy linear combination as long as it's finite. Okay? So it feels from this expression that this f should depend on the specific alpha i I'm choosing. But if things are linearly independent, dependent, I can actually choose different alpha and obtain the same result. You agree? Yet, and so this might give you the feeling that this inner product is not well defined because it seems to depend quite heavily on the coefficients. Okay? You see the question? This guy are not linearly, let me repeat, this guy are not linearly independent, so the alpha i. There might be more alpha i, so there will be a sequence alpha 1, alpha m, and it's equal alpha prime 1, alpha prime m, that gives the same f. So now I define this inner product, and it feels like it depends on alpha. So how come? So if it does, then it means that I don't have a well-defined inner product because I can change the value even for the same function. But notice that I can always write this. also an equality which is true, right? F is what? F of x. It does this expression evaluated in x. Okay? So if you just stare at this, when you take the summation over m, you get f of x in j, right? That's what I wrote there. What about it? Well, here, I, you know, I've been a bit short. You have to say alpha one, alpha m in R, x one, m in a natural number of any length. It's important that this thing is inside the parentheses, not inside. I'm not fixing a priori the length. It can be any. Okay, so this m is any length, and this n is any length. This, is this clear? Because f is defined this way. When I look at this inner product, and I just take this first, I take the sum over the i's, and this gives me just f of x at j. Now, this expression here only depends on f, not the alpha i that I used to actually write down the f. So if I give you alpha or alpha prime, as long as they give me f of yj, this will be fine. Okay? So in case you were wondering, how comes that this expression doesn't depend? on the specific coefficient, this is the proof. And I did it now for f. You can always do it for also for a g in the same way. Okay? So this shows that this specific expression does not depend, depends only on f and g and not on the specific way we actually write them down. the kernels are not linearly independent, right? Then that would mean there's an alternative sequence of beta j's that defines g. And so it's clear that you know the, there's no dependence on alpha in this expression, but there is a dependence on beta. You can do it. Uh, you know, you can do it first on f and, for, and, and then on uh, on. Uh... Right. Like, how do you? Don't you need to eliminate the dependence on both alpha? No, that, 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 that's that suffices for this. You know, this is all you need because basically what you see, you, you can do it one at a time essentially. You know, I do it like this, and then I could do the other way around. So th this is all you need. Okay. So anyway, so this is a, again, this is a detail for whoever was asking this uh, time, and it doesn't take more than a line to to uh, get a better feeling of how this goes. So this is what we did: we build the space, we build the inner product. You see that this is I have to still be able to, in some sense, uh, uh, ensure that uh, um, I can let sums go to infinity in a sense. And this is what is called the complete to complete a space. 
So the step you need to do is technically is basically what, let me denote like this. You have to take this H and take all Cauchy sequence and be sure that they're in this space. But this is just a mathematical construction. So basically, if you can ensure that you have uh, a Hilbert space with this property, then basically there are fundamental mathematical that shows you that you can complete it, okay? So this last step is purely technical and there is no intuition. It's just the fact that you can basically make sure that things go fine when you let things go to infinity, okay? So not only arbitrary length, but uh, let things go to infinity. So this last step we skip uh, at once because it's not really much more than, uh, you know, it's just a pure functionality collection. The completeness of the Hilbert space come from the fact that it's a reproducible kernel one? Because there's a lot of Hilbert space that are not complete. No, 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 so the, it, it, I'm, I'm taking, Again, technically, I'm taking a pre-Hilbert space, which is what this is, and, I sh and a pre-Hilbert space can always be completed, okay? So, and for those who don't, who don't know what I just said, forget it, okay? There is one step which is technical. I'm showing you this, not to entertain you with this between pre-Hilbert space and Hilbert space and the subtlety of completing a space, but just to show you that this space that you build looks like this. It's a linear combination of kernels. That's kind of interesting. And the inner product is written by the kernel. So that's also kind of interesting. And you see that the kernel becomes something useful, okay? Not just some abstract thing. The rest is for uh, details lovers, and I'm happy to discuss, but no worry about that, okay? The, the thing that you can do is that checking that once you set up this structure, it is by construction a reproducing kernel over space. And the reproducing kernel is exactly the positive definite function you use. And this is, this is a no-brainer, okay? It's basically just replacing here k of x, okay? k of x certainly is a special function in there. Put k of x, you get that for free. It lives in the space, and the inner product is actually f of x. It's the case where basically you just kill this sum and you just take one point, okay? So the main part of this implication is in building the space, and then there is a technical point, and then checking that you're producing Hilbert spaces for free, okay? What do we gain out of this? We now have a way to build spaces. As long as you can come up with a k that is positive definite and symmetric, you have a function space. So this is something that, you know, has been going on forever because what was the, what we had before? Well, we know that if we had one dimensional signal or we had a Fourier analysis, we could try to use it to build spaces. We know that if we could invent finitely many features that were linearly independent, then we could invent the space. Now I'm telling you that if you give me a kernel, I can also invent the space, okay? So I give you, we now have at least three ways of building spaces. Fourier, features, and positive definite functions. And they're all equivalent, by the way. So you, they're all intimately related. Far so good? Any questions about this stuff? So let me make one comment before I proceed and tell you the last two pieces of, uh, of what's going on. One thing is, why do we spend the, uh, uh, almost two classes uh, plus on this, because again, we, I'm assuming that this is not the first time you see this stuff. I'm assuming that you've taken classes where you've seen things like uh, dictionaries and kernels, and at some point you're like, okay, but what are these things? Are they related? They're not. Okay, then there is the feature map and the positive definite, and then Fourier. How are all these things related? And it turns out that this is such a big topic, and it's, yet it's kind of hard to find self-contained introduction to the topic, okay? And so, and, and even when you find it, reading through, because there are so many simple but also complicated things might be hard. So this is meant to be a self-contained introduction to a topic you have seen before, presented in a self-contained way and pointing out what is conceptual and what is technical, okay? Specifically tailored to an audience which is not uh, just mathematician, but actually somebody who is actually interested to do a step beyond just using it and try to understand a bit more of the structure. And then, of course, a little bit of personal bias in choosing uh, of sloppiness uh, versus intuition. So this is the reason for this class, and this is exactly what it meant to be. And you know, if you have never seen kernels before or dictionaries before, this is sure you're dying essentially now. But also, I'm sorry, but this was not uh, meant to be for you. Okay? So come Friday and cry, and we'll be happy to to try to uh, you know get in a better shape. Okay. Last step is perhaps the, the, the simplest is the one that we're going to carry on for the most of the time is the connection between yet another thing. Let's say, now let me say we have K, we have PD function, positive definite function. Let me add feature maps. 
But there are feature maps. Again, the game here is going to be the same. I'm going to introduce an object. Nothing else exists in the world. And then I'm going to see that I can build this stuff. And once I have this stuff, I can build one of these objects. Okay? And in fact, more than one. So you have to, if you get confused, then what do I don't? It's always a legitimate question. OK, so what is a feature map? So you assume that you have a space F where you have an inner product. So you have a Hilbert space, again. And then you have a map from the data space into the Hilbert space. OK, that's it. This is what we call a feature space and a feature map. It's a map that sends the data into another space. And it is not just any space. There is some structure. It's a linear space. It is a space with an inner product. And uh, you know, this space at this level can be anything, right? So for example, what is the simplest example of feature map and feature space you can think of? I always hear something like the sounds like this. I need the, the, you know, the, I need the last part of the sentence. The simplest example. Take the data and yeah, do nothing. You know, take 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 this and do nothing. Okay. What does it mean that you send x into itself? Okay. And this happened to be, notice that x doesn't have to be anything, right? So in general, this doesn't work. X for us is a is graphs, is craziness. But if it happens to be R D, say, or L two or something, you just send it into itself, and that's okay. Okay. And because it's all we need here, it's fine. Can you give me another example? Regression, for example. Say again? Regression. Regression. Regression, it says regression. Regression is the input and the output. Uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe. I, I, here I just have, say, inputs. And I just want to map them somewhere. And you can, have, I'm just telling you, tell me somewhere. Okay. He said, I don't want to move. I just stay here. And that's fine. It's the laziest thing you can do. You know, in binary values. You know, you take X, okay, you could take X, okay, say for example, it's a vector, and then you quantize its entries. And for example, you send it uh, uh, vertices of an hypercube. Okay, fair enough. Kind of fair enough, because what is the linear structure and the inner product there? Now, but we already have examples. For example, take a set of features, okay? Take a set of function. So let's make this example instead. Take a step of function uh, of, uh, of uh, function that goes from x to r. Okay, I don't use them to build functions. I don't care about building functions. I just want to few of them. Can you build a space and a map to do this? What? Yeah. You want to linear combine this? Then you're going to take these what? Numbers? Yeah, but why would you want to take a function? I just want to map the data. The idea here is that I want to take the data and I want to map them somewhere else. So if you take the identity, you take a vector and you map into a vector. Okay? So the idea, the intuition, you know, we call this a feature map and a feature space. Okay? We don't call it solving a regression problem or solving a classification problem. So the idea is that we are building features, replacing features with other features. Okay? We want to attach to this guy a description. We want to get something decently rich. Fair enough. Okay, but again, let's uh, let's uh, let's take one step at a time. So one. Let, right. So this is what this is the one thing that came out of this example. Okay, we're going to do a polynomial next. Take this. Okay, and then apply each of these function on every point. Okay, so you define phi x be phi 1x, phi px. Fair enough. That's the definition. What is capital calligraphic f in this case? Rp. You need to say anything more? No, that's it. That's all the definition wants. A map and a space, and that's it. OK? Good enough? Assume for a minute that x is equal to R2. Okay, the input space is R2. 
consider the map. Example one, let's do example two. This could be the map, you know, something that send R2. And what you do is that you take any X, okay, X is a vector of two numbers, the first and the second coordinate of the vector, and it sends it into phi of X. For example, it could be take X1 square, take X2 square, and then add the one. Somebody said polynomials. This is going in that direction. I take in monomials of the entries. And I could take more, right? I could take the cross monomials, take it to the first order. I do this because I just want to draw something in a minute. Okay. This is just one special case of this, right? It's just the case where I take square of something and not of something else. What am I doing? How I want to think about this as a pre-processing that is mapping the data into a new space of coordinates. So suppose that in this case can be drawn. You basically have you know, this is my x. I, have, I draw finitely many, but this holds for any set. And then I'm going to map into the three-dimensional space okay. in some kind of potentially nonlinear way. It's not just a change of coordinates. I'm really, I can go big. I can let the dimension go larger. Okay. So that's what you think about when you think about a feature map or a feature space. Typically, typically, potentially enlarging the dimension of your data by looking at nonlinear uh, mappings. Okay. So good? Yes, absolutely. So the, the, you know, the, the zero example, let me put it here, is uh, even more. I say X is RD, and, uh, which is also equal to F, and phi is the identity. I want, and he's basically saying, well, if, if I have an inner, all I need is an inner product. So if it's infinite dimensional, it's fine too. So you could put L2 here. Okay, that's fine too. The feature map is just a function that maps to an Hilbert space. Take the data and map them somewhere where you know how to take inner products and you have some structure, potentially infinite dimensional. And we're going to give example in a minute. Okay. Okay, so. Why do we introduce this and how is it related to representing kernel Hilbert space in a second? that every reproducing kernel or every positive definite function we can think of as an inner product. And any function in a reproducing kernel space we can think of as a line, as a hyperplane in this induced space. Okay? So these strange function we introduced so far, they have this kind of special, special um, interpretation. So that's why I introduced this. So we're going to do this by consider some of these uh, implications. Okay? So we want to basically show first Something simple, which is that if you have a feature map, then you can build a positive definite functions. Okay? How do you do that? So I want to use phi to define a k, which is positive definite. And in fact, I also see metric. How? Take phi. This is this one is simple. I take phi. For any x and x prime, I just consider the inner product. This symbol is well defined, right? Because that's all I have. Again, I'm a, I'm assuming I give you this, and I'm trying to get something else. And how you define the kernel? Just like this. This is the way you define k. Is it symmetric? Yeah, it's just the inner product. Is this po is it positive definite? Positive definite is written there. How, how would you check it? Well, now we don't have to check for any generic case, just for this k. But this k is an inner product. So that's what we've been doing so far. Whenever you have an inner product, you can basically push in the sums and just rewrite that condition as the norm of something. OK? Same story. So we are done. So this. This is it, okay? Right in the book. The symmetry is done and the, the positive definiteness comes from the, exactly the one example we did, the linear case. Okay? So as you see, you know, some of the things we introduce is because we use them a few times. Some other uh, disappears, and so that's why we push them a bit. Okay, but notice 
he gives me a bunch of stuff because I have a positive definite current. So it means that you came up with something like this, and now all of a sudden you can build the positive definite kernel, and which means that you can build the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And notice that I actually dropped uh, two assumptions that I made, for example, when we introduced this. When we introduced this to build the space, how did we do it? We already knew how to build the space out of a dictionary. How did we do it? Linear combinations. And that was a linear space. But then we have to worry that the map was one to one. We have to worry that we're linearly independent to define an inner product. But now, I can take another route, which is give me this feature map, define the kernel, and then define the space defined by this kernel. It's a Hilbert space, it's nice, it's a linear space, inner product. Do I have to worry about linear dependence? Inner product is, in the, the inner product in the previous case was the sum, if you remember what I was doing is that I was doing something like this, right? I was taking F, which was the WJ phi J, This and to define the inner product was taking the product of this number times these numbers. I'm not doing that anymore. That doesn't work. Oh, we see in a minute that it works, but you have to sweat a bit more. What I'm doing is that I'm taking this guy, I build the kernel, and then I use the construction that we sketched there, based at the inner product, and that's fine. Okay? So you can actually use any finite set of features, and that's okay. So the the, the, the assumption that things have to be linear dependent is gone. It's kind of nice, right? It means that if you want to go the kernel way, you have to check positive definiteness. If you want to come up with a set of features, anything is good. Okay? You don't have to worry about linear independence. This is actually, I'm remarking because it's one of the things that, you know, uh, sometimes one forgets and then one worries about something should not. What about... Finite dimensional. All you need to be sure is that when you define, you know, in the specific example, you need you need this expression to be to, to have a meaning, right? So in that one specific example, you have to take the expression which is phi j x, phi j x prime, j from one to infinity now, and be sure that this makes sense. Okay? So to go to infinite dimension, you do have to ensure something, which is basically that the sum, you can check that all you need to check is actually what happens at the point. So this is implied by this condition, which basically means take the function, evaluate at the points. If those values sum up, you're good to go. And you can use any infinite dimensional set of features. And this condition can be shown to hold for... Uh, Essentially, you have to take all orthonormal bases that you know and reweight them slightly. Okay. We don't want to do that now, but um, what I want to do now is just emphasize the fact that this kind of long route we took actually allowed us to build the function spaces not only from finite set of linearly independent atoms, but actually potentially infinite dimensional set, so to find this expression, of potentially linearly dependent atoms. Okay? So it gives some freedom in choosing spaces. No, oh, no. So he's asking if K is a reproducing kernel in the space F. Okay. But if you see, what, is the, what are the examples we made? For example, here F was RP, whereas the kernel is the kernel in the space of functions. Okay. Or here uh, F is again R3, whereas the kernel will be in the space of function on R2. So there is a strong, I'm going to make the point that there is a strong relationship between two spaces are related. I'm going to show you why. But strictly speaking, there is like, you know, it's like when you take the function and then you, the, when they're linear, you say, I take a vector instead of the function. So there's this distinction. Do you want to take the slope of the function or the actual function? Okay? It's the same connection. And I'm going to point it out in a minute. For now, I'm just saying, give me a mapping of the data into some space, okay? And now, for now, I just, I just showed that then I give you for free a positive definite kernel. This is what, this is the result we're discussing. Then, 
you are in this world. Okay, that's it. Then you, then you are building these things here. So I'm not proving that f is a representative. I'm proving that you can use that k to build this guy, and it's fine because we already did it. And remind you for that. Okay. Okay. Yep. They were not in the finite dimensional case. You mean they were set to yeah. the No, Now there are. So uh, depends who you ask. So the, the answer I know is the following. Do you know what is a tight frame? Yeah. So if you take instead of basis, there are more the more general notion of basis. That for example, take care of the situation where things are linearly independent. Ritz basis, frame, tight frames, and so on. There are, there are much more general notion than basis, but they're not crazy. Can do a lot of stuff. Okay, so it turns out for those of you who know what they are, that these guys, this phi j in the infinite dimension, they form what is called the tight frame. So it's not just anything. Okay, if you know what is the tight frame, does it matter to you? Probably not. Okay, it, it basically just shows you that you have a lot freedom, a lot of freedom to, to choose. Almost done. We just want to sketch one second uh, a more direct way to given a feature map. Well, actually, we have to do two things. One is showing how, given a feature map, I can build a, a positive definite function and so reproducing in Hilbert space. Is this a one to one relationship? No. Given a feature map, I can build only one reproducing in Hilbert space. But given a reproducing in Hilbert space, I actually have many feature maps. So they're related, but not in a trivial way. And the game now is, I give you H, which is in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, with kernel A, okay? Let's build a feature map. What we need to do, we have to find a map phi from X to somewhere, okay? And that's all we need to do. So look, I'm gonna do two examples. The first one is take H, sorry, take calligraphic F to be equal to H, Okay, take phi x to be equal to kx. I have an interesting example. It gives an interpretation of something we just did. Consider the example where this guy is the Gaussian, okay? Just for the sake of simplicity. What am I doing? I'm taking every point and I'm sending it in the space of Gaussians centered at that point. So this is the example where I take these coordinates and I take the linear combination. Here I'm taking this guy and I'm sending it in the space of Gaussians. Infinite dimensional object, very high dimensional. And then in that space I'm going to take a linear combination. See? I'm just taking linear combination of Gaussians. So I take a very, very high dimensional space and I look for lines there. And of course in the original they're not lines at all. They're just linear combination of Gaussians. But it's pretty awesome because it, it feels like I can actually think about combination of Gaussian as lines somewhere. So it looks like I can just do things with lines, and then at some point you say, oh, no, no, sorry, I was cheating. I actually, this is not the original space. This is the space up in here. So this gives you a way to think about, uh, for example, that expression in a nice way, okay? And also it gives an example that shows that feature map need not to be uh, finite dimensional. They can be infinite dimensional. This is an infinite dimensional space. You can take any of the examples we already considered and do similar stuff, band limited, so on and so forth. You can do something similar. Okay? Second example. Take F to be little L2. Remember, little two is the space of summable sequence. Okay? You can also take RP if you prefer. And take phi j, now remember, now I have h, okay? I do have h, I just wanna build the phi. Take h and take phi j, to be an orthonormal basis in h, okay? So I'm, I'm going the other way around. I, I have the space and I want to build the feature map. How do I do it? I take an orthonormal basis in h, and what do I do? What is still written here, okay? Notice the difference here is that in this example, I gave you this, but I didn't know anything else. Now I give you this, and I know that there are orthonormal bases in the space. 
which means that I can only write function one way because the basis is orthonormal. And so I can now define the inner product in a usual way. And so now I can represent the, this is basically the way in which you, you take the functions and you just represent them with their coefficients. They can be infinitely many and it's just a different representation. So in some sense, this goes back to your question because you see, F is not the reproducing Kernelberg space, but in many examples, it's either coincide with it, in one example, or in some sense, it's equivalent. It's like when you take two functions and you take a basis and another basis. You have the coefficients in one basis and the coefficient in the other basis. Are these things equivalent? No, there is a that goes from one to the other. Okay, so they're almost, they're almost the same thing. There are two different ways to look at the same thing under two different sets of bases. He's kind of, he's not quite the same, but he's in, in principle, in, in spirit, is the same idea. Okay. So that's it. We don't want to spend two words on it. More words. If you have a feature map, you can immediately be the positive definite function, and so are producing kind of space. If you have a reproducing Kernelberg space, you have not one, but many feature maps. And I gave you two. There are, of course, you can take any other orthonormal basis. You can take any rotation. You have infinitely many examples. And you can take, indeed, there are infinitely many possible feature maps associated to one reproducing kind of space. Okay? So this is the first relation we see that is not one to one. Given a kernel, you have many representation in terms of feature maps, which is also something that somewhat caused confusion for a while. Okay. So, any questions about this? Everything is perfectly clear. Okay. Yes. Little L2. So suppose for a minute, just, just for the sake of simplicity, assume that the dimension of H is uh, P. Okay? Is that the case? Then an orthonormal base is going to be P elements. And so this is going to be RP. The coefficient on that basis. If I drop this assumption, p can go to infinity, and so, you know, if this can be smaller or equal than infinity, then this can also be the space with infinitely many coordinates. Okay. Yeah. X maps it to the sequence of coefficients of. No, not in the the maps x. In the element of the basis, or whatever it is, evaluated in X. Okay, take X and maps it into phi one in X, phi two in X, phi three. Okay, value of the functions. And okay, we have one, one last remark. It's actually a statement which is cute, but whose proof is complicated. So we just want to appreciate the statement, and it's actually the following thing: if I give a feature map. And right now, I want to go and build the reproducing Kernberg space. How do we do it for now? We first build the positive definite function, and then implicitly through that story, we build the space. Okay? Can I go here directly? Can I build the space directly without first building the kernel and then build the space? The idea would be to do something like this. Define a space H5. Directly, I want directly goes from feature map to functions on X. How do I do it? Functions such that there exists a W in X. X is equal to W phi X. Okay. So I'm. If you want, in our little game here, we, okay, we did this the other time. Now we went this way, okay? And we actually went this way because given a reproducing kernel, we showed that it, it defines feature maps. And we could, done. everything is equivalent already, right? But there is one more equivalence which is interesting in its own right, which is going directly from here to here. So to do that, I want to build a space out of my feature map. And this is how I do it. Notice that the story of this one line is exactly take the data, 
them in this space and now just take linear com lines, okay? This is, this is what they are. They, are. they are just functions in there. Yes? Yeah, yeah, this, this, all this, you see this stuff? All X and then, yeah. yes, now I, I rewrote them just because it's, but they look the same more. <laughs> Does this make sense? So I take the data, map them into this feature space, and then I take lines there. Clearly, if I go back and just look at this guy, again, it's, there's no reason to believe it's going to be linear. But I can think of functions in a linear way. If you hate functional analysis, I gave give you a way in which you basically can say, ah, forget it. I'm using spaces that whenever I look at the function, it's actually just a linear function somewhere. That guy with a beard told me that there is some mumbo jumbo I can do to fix the math. <laughs> That's kind of what's going on here, okay? Tommy Lopez is what is called the, the kernel trick. So uh, kind of really the, the highlight of you know, the, the bringing this down to, to low level because it tells me that uh, every function can be seen just as a line. I didn't, I didn't, I'm not gonna show you this, but let me just finish the story with a couple of things, which are, first of all, this is clearly a linear space, okay? So I, it's not clear at all for now why this space should be a reproducing kernel bear space or equal to the reproducing kernel bear space with kernel given by this. Okay, the claim here is not only that this is a nice space, but it's actually the same space that these two constructions, the one where you take feature maps, you go to the positive definite kernel, you build the space, or this construction where you do like, boom, they're equivalent, okay? They're completely equivalent. This way of building the space or the other one are equivalent. They give you the same function space, and the kernel is exactly the expression there, the one that gives you the positive definite function, okay? So I say that it exists, but I said there is no unique. So what only means that there exists at least one F for which I can do this thing. So F doesn't exist up to now. So I said there is at least at least one F, one W that I can use to write that. It doesn't say that there is a unique W. Okay. That, that's, that, that's actually kind of the, the sort of next thing I'm going to show you, which is the knowing bit. This space here, the goal, the end of the story will be to, to show, and we're not going to do it because it's, it's not super complicated, but it's not easy enough that I feel like I can convey any useful information. The end of the story is to show that if you define k this way, then that the hk and this h phi are the same thing. So let me call hk the reproducing kernel space that I can build using this kernel. Defined by this phi this way, okay? Let me call h phi this space. The end of the story is a theorem that shows that these two things are the same thing, completely equivalent, okay? Some subtlety that I don't care about right now. Let's take one more step to see that there is some structure going on. It's clear that this, is, this space here has a, linear, has a linear structure. You can sum up things and multiply by numbers. What about inner products? What about norms? That is the comment that he made, the fact that these W are not unique makes our life hard because I, I cannot just take, I cannot just take, uh, uh, no, I cannot just say the inner product between any two F here is just the inner product between two corresponding Ws. No, you cannot do that. There are many possible Ws, okay? And so that's kind of the, that's kind of, if you want, the, the things that I'm skipping, which is the one uh, that is the main point of difficulty in this proof, showing that even though you have multiple ways to write the function, you can still define a nice inner product. Yes. They can all the omegas, and then you can just do it F with index with omega that will give you the all the Fs, plus something else that might, that might be there. I can't do it. 
so f of x is equal to the inner product between uh, omega w? and yeah. w, w, w and uh, phi of yeah. x. Yes. So for every for every uh, for every w to fill in f, right? The same f. The same f. So I'm just saying. So for every w, so for every w you can build an f, but for the same f you can have more than one w. Okay, so you can have w, w prime, and it gives you the same f. I mean, it's the same comment I made that you know the example where I take a linear space which is not uh, atoms that even in finite limit they're not linearly dependent. It means that we were stuck before this story, right? We had no idea how to deal with it because how do you define an inner product? You have two different w's for the same f. So if you write uh, w transpose uh, v, where v, you know, and I have, a, I have a g that is defined by v and v prime. So these are vectors. So how the hell I define f times g? Just based on this, it's unclear because I have multiple ways to represent them. And, uh, you know, we went through all that discussion to basically fix that. Well, because I just define it this way, right? <laughs> Absolutely, so yes. Could that be the case here? Like, so if you give me a W, you always have an F. But if you give me an F, I might have more than one W that give. That, that, that's all that, you know, these two lines pretty much says whatever. Like, like, you always find a W. All the W F, like, corresponding F. No, but that's what is written here. You know, there exists a W for which I find. So for, these are the F for which I can find the W, okay? So whenever I say, if you say F is in H phi, it means that there exists a W, okay? Okay. Projections so, onto Ws, or, you know, it's basically a set of projection functions. No, that's the way it. Projections are, you know, projection, I mean, again, it depends a bit because we have to be careful in uh, when we use technical words uh, into intuition. So technically speaking, this is not a projection. In some sense, I'm taking an inner product. So if you mean something like that, maybe. But technically speaking, it's not, not necessarily a projection. F didn't exist, and now I'm doing that. The next part of the proof, do you need the its separation level? No. No, it's more or less like showing that you know the, the, that understanding that uh, the fact that you have no uniqueness here doesn't hurt you too much roughly speaking the idea to some extent the intuition of the proof is basically I can take many W's but one of them has a smaller norm it's simpler than the other okay and that's kind of the one I need to choose to make the problem well defined showing that that construction there is implicitly choosing among all the W's here the simpler one in a precise sense okay so if this can help, this is the main intuition of this proof, but we're not going to do it. And all we want you to know is this story here, which instead is kind of nice. It says all those functions that we've been talking about so far, you can only think of this as a line according to some feature map. You might know it or not. You might have started from the kernel, in which case you might not have it. And you might have started from the feature map, in which case you have it. Okay. So we took a lot of, uh, we actually, did a lot of stuff because now we, we know many ways of building spaces, infinite dimension, and all uh, uh, a bunch of different ways. And what we want to do now is to draw some of the consequences of this kind of construction we did. I'm going to skip completely the connection with the integral operators. Okay, it's uh, in the rest of the course. It's actually very very nice. It's related to PCA and kernel PCA and caron leuven expansion and so on and so forth. There is a whole connection in some processes. We we are not going to discuss that at least for now but it's something you know for example you might want to look at in projects if you care about any of this um, so in particular you know a topic that it's uh, it's uh, it's quite interesting the, the so-called Merce theorem that is the, basically giving you the connection between uh, reproducing calibre space and integral operators we skip that so what we do now is instead uh, taking a look at the one first uh, implication of all this story back to our learning scenario. There is a bit of a puzzle. So why did we went all this way? Because you remember, we at some point, a long time ago, we actually said that this is a course about machine learning. And when we said that, <laughs> we actually said that uh, uh, the problem was that we, 
we wanted to minimize an expectation with respect to measure of some loss function over the space of all possible functions. And we also said that we all, all we have is a sample solve. You would like to minimize this expectation, but you, don't, you cannot evaluate the expectation because you don't have access to it. All you have is a bunch of samples. And these symbols here just means that each of these guys from the, exactly the same distribution, and they're all independent to each other. So it's just the product distribution. Okay. By the way, a comment that I didn't make the last time is the, the fact that we need independence here can be relaxed in a bunch of ways. The fact that we always want the same distribution is super important because it actually defines the problem. So if you want to try to kill that, you have to go to really a different class. Okay, yeah, whatever we are saying doesn't extend in any simple way to the case of non-identically distributed data. But to non-independent data, no, yeah, a bunch of stuff can be done. Remark. Okay, when we were talking about machine learning, this is the problem we introduced. And then we basically worried about two things. One is that we don't have access to the true distribution. And the other thing is that we, this here, okay, now there are too many Fs in the game, so let's call this uh, What was that is the biggest space for which I can define that integral, like all the function that, that for which I can take. It's a ginormous space and it's completely useless. And so our worry was, okay, I need to take a space which is large, but not too large, for which I can do computation, blah, 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 blah. blah. And guess what? We're always going to work in reproducing Cranberry spaces. Sometimes you're going to make them trivial. For example, we're going to take spaces of linear function or combination of linear functions. Some other time, we're going to consider fancier examples. But they're always going to be reproducing Calibre spaces. And so we allow everything we discussed so far for free. OK? So that, that's the main idea. So the idea is that we, if you remember, we actually want to go from this to, first of all, considering instead of the true expectation, an empirical expectation over the data. And instead of the whole space, another space. OK? That was the basic idea we started from. And then the idea was, uh, yeah, but you know, if I do this, then I have to be a bit uh, worried about the fact that uh, I, if I make h too small, even if you give me a lot of data, I'm never going to get to that solution. If you give me h big, if you give me a lot of data, I might get to that solution. But if you give me very few data, or not a lot of data, I might get a very small error for this guy, but not for this guy. The picture is the typical picture of overfitting like situation that Tommy showed at the beginning. I give you this data, OK? And you, oh, use lines, OK? And then you just say, OK, maybe, okay let's make it a bit more. Take this line, for example, or maybe something. Okay, that's simple. Now, if I change the data slightly, if I take, for example, one point away, probably this is not going to change like crazy. But also, if I give you a lot of data, well, you're stuck with lines. You don't get anything better. And it look, it does, this doesn't look like the underlying function is actually a line. But this is the case where h is chosen to be too small. If I actually allow to myself h to be extremely big, then I get something like this. You can check that, of course, if you give me a lot of data points and I can trust those points, I'm happy. But if these points are not so many, you know, if this, for example, was noise, it, it, you know, once I don't have it, I change completely the shape of my function. So it's very unstable. A big H gives me very uh, unstable answer for a finite set of data. So that, that was you know, the beginning of our story. And we said at the beginning, well, the, play, the game we're going to play is that we're going to try to choose ginormous H as large as possible. And then we're going to try to change this idea by adding something that penalizes when we're looking at complicated functions. And that's what we want to do now. We basically want to say, I want to consider now regularization. I want to consider a big space. Let's give a name to this. This quantity is what we call the expected risk. And it should be easily denoted in my note this way. And this is what we call the empirical risk. 
that is denoted like this. So the little hat is a reminder that this is something empirical. The idea is that now we want to consider. But we want to choose H to be a reproducing cranberry space, and in principle, this space can be extremely large. Okay? So what we're going to do is that we're actually going <coughs> to add here some functional. This functional here is what we call regularizer. The idea is that the regularizer is sensitive to these different behaviors. If a function is very simple, the regularizer is going to be small. If a function is very complicated, the regularizer is going to be big. Can you give me an example of regularizer? <coughs> Saying del2 norm, say, so take f to be a linear function, and then take that, just linear, and take rw to be some squares. This. Can you give me another example? Yeah, the L2 norm of the derivative. You remember that? The L2 norm of the derivative was a measure of how something was wiggling. And we could have taken any of this other, you know, translation invariant kernel. Take any reproducing kernel over space, which is translation invariant, and that was a measure of the thing was wiggling. Okay? So we can take F to be in uh, long, so I'm not going to write it. Well, actually, we can write it like this. This is the space in one dimension where the kernel was just a e to the minus x minus x prime for some gamma. And then remember that the norm in that space square just norm. I'm doing things in one dimension here. So if you remember, this is example one. And we're going to discuss him a little more in a second. This is example two. Take the reproducing space with kernel given by the exponential, not by the Gaussian, then its norm could be written as the norm of the L2 function of the norm plus the L2 norm of the derivative. So if the derivative, if the function doesn't have much stuff going on and derivative is always constant, this is small. But if I get something which is very complicated, this is going to be big. Okay. This case requires a bit more words, right? Because what's going on here? The linear function don't, get, don't seem too complicated in that picture. So what the hell am I doing when I'm constraining the linear function to have a small sum of coefficients? So why does it still make sense to consider this? It does. It's actually one of the main choices one consider. But why? When does it make sense? One dimension, right? The key point is that you're going to go in higher dimensions. So in higher dimension, what's going to happen is that we're going to see it in various ways, that when you have many, many high dimensions, uh, you know, if you just try to say, can I find the W for which I can do this? Just think of this interpolation equation. I give you n points, and I want to find the line that passes through the points. Okay? In one dimension, well, as long as I give you few, more than two points, uh, you, 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 cannot, uh, you cannot get this satisfied, right? But if you go in high dimension, it, it depends on how many points you give me and how many dimensions you give me. So if I give you a few points in very high dimensions, you can, of course, found it, because this is just solving a linear system, right? You can put this. You can stack all this in, in a matrix, which is n. So this is Rd. Basically, a matter of uh, how many equations and how many degrees of freedom. So, if you're dealing with the problem where you say I have a hundred in a thousand dimensions, then I can actually interpolate them exactly. I can get zero error on my data with linear functions. This is really misleading. It's just a low dimensional picture. You know, the simplicity of linear function is a function of how many points I have and how many dimensions I have. Of course, if you give me a lot of points, I'm going to end up in this situation again. But suppose that you are in a situation where you have a finite number of points, and you have many more dimensions. 
we've seen that this dimension can be, you know, this is the special case where I have the input data themselves. But we've seen that, for example, perhaps it makes more sense to consider this situation. What do you do? You're saying, oh, you know, I don't know for my data. I don't like their, you know, I don't like images and pixels. So I'm going to come up with tons of numbers that are good to describe my image. And I, I don't know, I have a thousand image or a million image, but I'm still going to build five million features to describe them, okay? Because I don't know what's good, but I want to go big. Should I worry about it? Well, the idea here is that actually over-parameterize dramatically. In principle, if you don't put any constraints, you'll be able to exactly interpolate. But then we're going to put this norm. What is this norm do? A budget on the different dimensions. And the rough idea is once you fix the budget, if one of these w is not then I'm going to try to put it equal to 0. So when I try to learn a function, that's sure it has 5 million parameters, but I'm actually going to try to force the parameters that are not so important to be small. Are they going to be zero? In general, no. And we are actually going to discuss this at length. But in some sense, doing it, the idea is that once we're going to be learning, we're going to use this kind of norm to implement some implicit dimensionality reduction or approximate implicit dimensionality reduction. Okay? We keep the data, but somehow we say that certain direction are not so important. What I've just, I just said now is going to be made precise in a minute. Okay, so it was a question or it was just a remark? Okay, so these are two, if you want, these are two main examples of how we're going to build the regularizer. Okay, the sum of the square of the coefficients or something like this. And we're going to, see, more generally, you're going to, uh, we can consider this point of view once you have the feature map. Basically, the idea is that the, whenever you consider a norm, so for now, what we're going to do is that we're going to consider this to be just equal to the norm in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. These are just two examples. We're going to discuss the norm of the reproducing Hilbert space as our first example of regularizer. It covers these two special cases and many more. Okay. So what we're discussing right now are modeling ideas, right? I want to learn the functions. I'm, I'm back to the statistical problem. I want to learn a function. This means learning. I want to try to derive an algorithm. I try to use the data, then I have to worry about how uh, the kind of assumption I make on the data, the kind of modeling assumption. And here we start to make some. We take a big space of functions, either big because it's really big, or it's big because with respect to my data is big. Okay? So this is a very big space because it's infinite dimensional. This is just finite dimensional, but if you don't have a lot of points, it can still be very big because I'm over parameterizing. And then I worry about regularizing explicitly by adding something that kills the extra complication, extra dimension, extra wiggling, extra something. Okay, that's the basic idea of regularization. Second, how do we know that when we regularize, we're still minimizing what we're trying to Correct. Right. So the first question is why do we look at the Because uh, uh, it's going to be. Is like probably the most famous and most classical example of regularization. It's gonna give us a lot of, uh, uh, we're gonna see that once you look at L2, you have a lot of nice properties, okay? We're basically gonna recover uh, most of the splines model, ridge regression, we're gonna consider kernel regression, lo kernel logistic regression, support vector machines, you name it, okay? And even when you go to deep networks, most deep networks are actually penalized and oftentimes you use this norm as a penalization and that's basically the reason why. And what we want to do is largely from now on consider the computational implication of this. If I choose here one of the, this guy depends on the loss function. The question is going to be, okay, depending on the loss function, the regularizer, what kind of properties we have? And we're going to talk about more optimization and numerical aspects and the interplay between these two things. In the, you know, from class six or seven on, we're going to discuss when this is something more like the L1 norm of the coefficients or generalization of that. So you're going to go from L1 to more general norms. This is going to open the world of three gazillion different kind of norms. So that's kind of the, you know, I teach roughly 15 classes. The second half is about not L2 norms. Okay. The first question you're asking is, is this, okay, but I'm changing the problem. My goal is to, ch is to solve this problem. This was the first guess. Now I'm giving a second guess. Can I prove that this is actually a good thing to do? Is it or not? Pretty good question. <laughs> That's why we actually develop learning theory, you know, or statistics. You know, whenever you talk about frequentist results for statistics, this are about basically ensuring whether this is a good idea or not and what are the implications of this choice okay so this course basically 
is not doing much of this. We actually mostly try to concentrate on different computational ideas. For example, here I gave you a computation, uh, you know, a, a algorithmic principle. Take the data, take a big space, penalize. Okay? Penalization is our guiding principle. Is the only way to design algorithms? Okay? And the answer is going to be no. You actually have many other ways. What are they? Are they related? This is mostly the kind of question we're going to ask. The other question you can ask is take, take any computational principle you want. This guy. Is it a good idea or not? And that's what statistical learning theory typically does. The statistical side of the story is proving that once you get, let's call f hat lambda, the function that minimizes that thing, showing that this is actually something that has a good expected error. So as I said, something like this. Let's call f star. If it exists, the function that minimizes this problem, then we want to study this. Okay? So when you study learning theory, typically you start to, you know, you put back your statistician hat, and then you assume that you know stuff that you don't know, and you say, okay, what are the implications of choosing that regularizer? Does this go to zero? How do I choose lambda? Can I choose it based on the data? How fast does it go to zero? And we're going to discuss this basically at the very end of uh, October for a couple of classes. For now, we just take this as a kind of an intuition, and we actually see many instances of this idea. Okay. But of course, you know, this is basically, you know, if you see machine learning as uh, the 15 people do bounds and everybody else, those 15 people then do bounds, they actually worry about these very important questions. Uh, I mean, as opposed to no, any other. Yeah. You can regularize it in different ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what he's saying, the question is, why did you choose this? Okay? And I guess the question up to now is why not? Okay? We don't we have to start from somewhere, right? So the goal here is not to try to show what is common of the idea here is just regularize is something that, that considers something to be simple, and these are examples. Okay? And as I told you, the idea will apply to many other choices. So the only thing, in, you know, the point is, why do I think of adding a penalty? Well, because I'm choosing a ginormous space. So that's quite acceptable as a, as a first step. The second question, which is very debatable, is why do I choose this to be this? Because it's there. And then we spend, you know, seven classes to go beyond that. But that's a super fundamental example. And the good news is that we don't start from one algorithm. By choosing different kernels, we actually recover a bunch. And by choosing different laws, also we recover a bunch. And once we've done this for the, the scalar case, we're going to get classification, multi-class classification, multivariate regression as adjustment of this story. OK, so this is just one place to start because it's a pretty fundamental one. OK. So now we take our statistician hat away, we throw it into and we go back to computations and we ask the following question. Officially replaced for now and for the next uh, couple of classes, this guy with uh, the norm. In the, so we say that this guy is a reproducing kind of space. We actually officially replace it with this. And now we ask the following question. How the hell do you solve that? Here is an easy case. My space is in the space of linear functions, right? Because basically, function f becomes vectors, and I can just take this is just a function on d variables and blah, blah, blah. But in general, how the hell do you do it? It's obvious, right? I, I spent, the, you know, we spent two classes to basically build infinite dimensional spaces, and now they come back and bite us, because how do you put an infinite dimensional space? Then you can say, well, I'm going to project and consider. Yes, but how? You know, how, how do you discretize? How you can you make it small? The whole game here would be to do it in an automatic way, because otherwise we are making things parametric. If you do it by hand, you're making things parametric. So the thing we want to check now is that, in fact, if you consider reproducing Cranberry space and this norm, then immediately you have that you can replace this function with some very nice space of functions, which is smaller. And is the space of function that I want to call Hn is the function in H, but not any arbitrary function. Is the function in H can be written as Rn, 
at f of x is equal to i i from 1 to n control x so look what I wrote here I'm saying the f I'm going to show that the minimum over h is actually the same as the minimum over hn what is hn looks very similar to that okay but notice there I could take any point Arbitrary length, uh, arbitrary many points located in everywhere, okay? Here, I'm just taking the training set point. So at most, they are, I'm combining n kernels. It's not obvious why this is true, okay? The proof is actually four lines. Uh, five minutes, I may be able to do it. It's actually pretty simple, for real. But let's just appreciate the consequence of this fact. Another way to say this is that the, you know, equivalently, my, my function, the one that I like, f lambda x, is actually equal to i from 1 to n k x x i c i. I'm not telling you how to find the ci's, okay? I'm not telling you how the coefficients are found. I'm just telling you that the function that solved this problem, even if in principle I'm considering infinite dimensional space, can always be written as a combination of at most n kernels at the training set points basically means that I talk about functions, but I could as well just talk about, sorry, this is n. Okay, n or m, depending how you see this, is the number of points, okay? So this space is huge, but the space of solutions that are spit out by this algorithm is actually not that big. It's just a linear combination of kernels at the training set points. So every function can now be identified by a vectors of length n. Why is this better than manually choosing a finite dimensional space? Who chooses how big is the space of function we consider here? Well, I choose the biggest, or you choose the biggest, and who chooses the actual space of function you can manage once you have a computer? The data. If your data are a lot, you need more coefficients. If your data are not so many, you need not so many coefficients. It just depends. That is not fantastic. It doesn't depend on how nice are the data, but the size of the data. If the data are many, I'm going to use more parameters. If the data are few, I'm going to use less parameters. That's it. It can be too many. If I give you three gazillion data points, they can be too many, and we might have to worry about that at some point. But for now, the nice thing is that I actually achieved what is called the non parameter Okay, non parametric. So I achieved the idea that I choose an infinite dimensional model and the data automatically land on finitely many parameters. Kernel methods, which are this guy, and Gaussian processes, which is basically a probabilistic interpretation or a probabilistic derivation of the same computational principle, are the two cardinal examples of parametric methods for regression and basically for classification too. And they're based on this theorem. This is actually a theorem, okay? This is what is called the representer theorem. It heavily, heavily relies on the presence of this L2 norm here. If you change this norm, if you take the two away, it doesn't really matter. But the fact that we choose this norm, it's important. If you take an L1 norm or an entropy norm or whatever norm you want to think about, it won't hold. That's one of the reasons we look at this. I'm not telling you about anything of the proof, but tell you why this is important. Because really, you can make the complicated problem solvable. Because basically, now you can, rather than having to worry about f, all you have to worry is about these coefficients. The way you find them will depend on the loss function. This fact is common for all loss functions. You'll see that you, know, you can check yourself what are the assumptions, they're minimal. But the actual shape of the coefficients is going to depend on the loss function. Make sense? Let me just say uh, uh, one minute and a half word about the proof, and then I'm, we're going to do it next time when you're fresh. The proof basically works like this. Okay? The idea here is consider the minimization over h, okay? and now take h and decompose it in the nice function, the one that looks like this, and everybody else. Okay? OK? 
okay? So we just do the, 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 the orthogonal decomposition of the space. We take a subspace of the, of the we like and everybody else. Then what do we do? We do the following. Step one, which is simple and yet somewhat instructive, is checking that because that this function disappears once you evaluate this function on the data. Okay, because of the way this is defined, when you take the orthogonal, if you evaluate, one, if you take one of these bad functions and you try to evaluate it on the data, it gets zero by definition of being orthogonal to this. This is the, you know, this is it. The proof of this fact, it's this thing here. Okay, so we're gonna spend five minutes on this. So basically it shows that if you take a function and you write it at the sum of these two, the second term will not appear here, it won't matter. And for this, it's just the sum of two squares. So the best thing you can do is to just kill this. But there is no gain in adding anything which is not already here because either it doesn't appear or you're just increasing the value of the function. So that's it, it's not complicated, it's literally two lines. And it's kind of cute because it gives a very general effect from a relatively simple argument, okay? Yes, so if basically if instead of you saying if instead of a square here, you take anything that increase when you add the stuff, it's fine, okay? And anything that depends on the data is gonna be fine, okay? So I think that's it and we meet next week.